So uh, as we begin this morning, uh, let's just check in with our own consciousness, <clears throat> see what we're bringing to the present, a slight, slight attitude or mood, a disposition, so we can scrape the container clean. And perhaps uh, whatever disposition or mood you're in feels very justified which they usually do because of the conversation and narrative we offer for its justification. We feel very um, righteous in having the mood or the orientation that we have. And that's the hardest thing to actually be willing to see because if you're willing to see it, then you have to give up the justification and therefore the power is diminished. You don't, you don't get the power in the observation. You get the truth in the observation, but you don't get the power in it. And so uh, it's, it's, it's a very close a scoring game as to whether we give ourselves over to the righteousness of why we feel the way we do or whether we're willing to scrape the bowl clean. So, but just for now, nobody will object if you take your righteousness back. But just for now, let's see it clean. Let's just see what it feels like not to let a state of mind determine our psychic posture. And perhaps the reward far exceeds the righteousness You can also get a sense that behind our holding, our need to be powerful, our need to be in a line with the mood that we're having and is, is a pain, is a, is a slight film of pain that can be laced very intimately with that righteousness. No one's ever listened to me and I'm perfectly justified in feeling the way I feel because the world has, my mother has, someone has in the past. <clears throat> and when you say those words, when we say those words to ourselves, we call up the phantoms of our past. We call up the devils within our hell. And they'll come, believe me. And they give you more justification. They give you more certainty that the mood or disposition that you're in is the right one. And the Dharma be damned. But in this moment, let us just see how easy this thing floats, free of its moorings, of its history, of the determined reference we give it. For if it is continued to seed throughout our life, it doesn't just turn into a momentary mood or emotional display. It hardens into a, the way we are, into our character, into our personality. And we find ourselves angry or anxious because we have now generalized the state of fear that was once so self-deserved to be paired with life itself so that life represents that anxiety or that anger or that sorrow. The mind has an enormous ability to generalize out and to paint its 
motion upon the living reality of whatever is presenting itself. Now, a Dharma student is required, an enormous amount of courage is required because it's breaking that pattern, that display. It's the willing to question long, hardened, and equally as certain orientations to life that are based upon the facts of having been treated a certain way. And the residual mood is proof Now the first place that awareness touches is the mood itself, which is very hot. It's like a we left the burner on the stove and accidentally touch it. It's very hot. Hot in the sense that it's justified. And most of us stop there. Most of us in Dharma know what mood we have. We get a sense of our psychic orientation in the moment, what we might be feeling. But to go behind it, to scrape it clean, requires even more persistence of awareness, a further questioning. Because when we get down to the glass bowl, behind all the muck, we face the assumptions that have led to that mood. the I assumptions. Which symptom is the mood? And down there, there is a deep and compelling narrative, personal narrative, that is being intoned again and again within our psyche. that has its annals and history going as far back as we can remember. And within all of the sound and assertions, we can usually find one central theme that compels it all forward some essential fact about ourself that has never been retested. It's never been re-exposed to any questioning or consideration. It has been kept calcified and darkened because the pain of it is so enormous we would rather not look. In fact, it is the last place we'll look. For, from our interpretation, it is the disease itself. We'll work with the symptoms, we'll work with the mood that's the offspring, the child of the assumption. But to work with the assumption itself feels too threatening because there we're working with the really the way we believe, what we believe about ourselves. And we'll hire a therapist to sort of work us around the edges of that. But even then, we may well be reluctant to go into the burning coal, the fire itself, because to even expose it to the therapist who we pay to reveal ourselves, it's too much. 
they would feel about us the way we feel about ourselves. They would have to, because how could anybody feel differently than the way I feel about myself if they knew what I was hiding? Now we're getting to the play of emptiness and self. Stay on the superficial, knowing what the emotion is or what the, well. But now we're getting to the very crux of it. And we did this not by bypassing our pain, but diving into it. We don't find selflessness skirting the issues of our humanity. We find it diving into the deepest waters of our psychology and asking questions from there. And as this sense of assumption is seen, felt, It is felt within the expanse of the present when it was contrived, when it was given birth. It didn't have the maturity to even have any reference. And it was quite likely far too young to know what it was being told wasn't true. And so it assumed those beliefs and held them for decades, until now, quite likely. And with patience and care, caring attention, we can recover where we lost ourselves within that assumption, just by exposing it. relentlessly. And as the sense of I starts expressing itself within the mood and the cries of the memory come forth and we hear the voices that are intoned within that mood, not the voices we're offering the mood now, but the voices that are intoned in the emotion. That is part of what is relieved. We just turn our ear, we place our ear to our heart and simply give permission for the complete revelation of that to be seen and heard, adding nothing. And it heals. It heals through the listening. That's the path. And all of the different ways we've compensated for this assumption, that we've worked out our life in action so that if we feel inadequate, we try to be perfect so that our perfectionism If somebody looks at the work we've done, they won't see the blemish of the person who did it. Or our desire to be liked because inside we feel so unlikable that we will make ourselves a presentation that is, that everyone will like. And on and on it goes. and our willingness to say enough, enough. I have bottomed out. I am an alcoholic. 